be a lot of fun. I got to see our guests live uh, up at Libretto in Paso Robles and was just um, introduced and amazed at the same time. But before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsors for this uh, afternoon's podcast and stream. Uh, Castillo's Carpet Cleaning of San Luis Obispo. Uh, Mr. Castillo and uh, his family, his um, crew will do an excellent job. Uh, their website is castillocarpetcleaning.com, located right in San Luis Obispo. They will take care of all of your carpet cleaning needs with excellence. There are a uh, carpet cleaning company of choice for our studio and our facility here in San Luis Obispo. Uh, the best in truck-mounted steam cleaning. I, I really like those guys. They do a great job. And then um, I want to uh, thank you uh, for tuning in and supporting Slow Talk Podcasting Studio. We produce, develop, record, distribute, and market podcasts right here at the studio. Check us out at slowtalk.com, and there's a whole section on podcasts. Uh, gosh, uh, folks have already asked, where is Martha at? Martha, if you're watching, we miss you today. Martha Torkington could not be with us. She's resting up for the holiday celebrations. And um, the last I heard, she's living the slow county life. Check that out on Instagram. That's uh, one of the things that Martha's doing and uh, some really fun stuff going on there. Well, you guys, uh, you've heard it before. Uh, the way I look at this today, the UFO has landed. And the UFO in the studio, the unidentified flying object, uh, sound effects included. Uh, Mr. Jim Barnett. Jim, welcome for the first time to Slow Talk Podcasting Thanks, Studio. Thanks, James. Yeah, it's good to have you. Um, I met you roughly about a year or so ago. Maybe it's been two years. Um, up at Libretto, we saw a couple of shows. And um, that trio that you did up at libretto was pretty amazing jim barnett thank you uh we had you of course on the steinway piano and then james gallardo on the stand-up bass and then um daryl voss on drums probably yeah. one of the best drummers in the whole area i agree how how did you reach out to those guys where did that all start how did that start to happen well they reached out to me it was, really it was uh new year's eve two years ago 2020 yeah and nobody was doing anything because COVID just started. Anyway, uh, Corey and Kate, who own uh, Amsterdam Coffee House up there on 13th in Paso, uh, James Gallardo was friends of theirs, and he was kind of booking entertainment for that venue. Yeah. And so uh, he contacted me and and got together with Daryl, and we uh, we ended up doing New Year's Eve uh, up there. It was we didn't advertise it because. It was hush hush. <laughs> and we're supposed a little to bit under the radar. We're supposed huh? to do it anyway. Pri private party. But we were there. Yeah. And so when Corey heard the trio, uh, that <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, that that particular evening, we had Corey's 1914 Steinway Grand, and uh, and I had tuned it because I'm a piano tuner. My dad was. Yeah. But it went out of tune as I was playing it. It was that bad. Corey said, you know, Jim, I really apologize. I've got a Steinway B coming. I just bought a real built, I rebuilt Steinway B, seven foot grand. We're going to extend the stage. It'll be here in two weeks. I want you to be the first to play it. So January 14th, we went back and we played it. And then we came back a couple of times later, the middle of February, he said, can you do every Friday night? He said, uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> I think so. And so that was the start of the residency gig up at Libretto in Paso Robles. Well, yeah. What happened was is that six months later, we had built such a following at Amsterdam that yeah. Corey and Kate were turning people away at the door. And they said, we, we need a bigger place. So they went around the corner 
to what used to be cantinas underneath Fish Gaucho ah, okay. at Park and 13th. Okay, no, right where and, it's at. And they leased it. They called it Libretto because, ironically, it used to be a long time ago at the Opera House. It's amazing. And so, uh, so uh, Corey went down to Beverly Hills and tried a bunch of Steinways, didn't like any of them, came back. And they called him a week later, and then they said, we think we have something for you. So he went back down there and saw the Steinway D, nine-and-a-half-foot concert grand, only 10 years old, 2012. And all the concert pianists that have come through have just raved over it, oh, but they have their own pianos. Steinway D, nine-and-a-half feet long. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's it's the biggest Ooh. Steinway. Yeah. And so Corey fell in love with it, and he paid for it and had him ship it up, and it's, it's at Libretto. We uh, opened the place in October of that year after they re- re-renovated it completely. Yes. And then we were there pretty solid every Friday night till the middle of uh, this year. Uh, then he started bringing in some Grammy Award winning uh, players from L.A. and San Francisco, which oh, yeah. was great, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and uh, we went back to Amsterdam while he was doing that. And then yeah. he... Business-wise, he figured out he was competing with himself, and and the business in Amsterdam was kind of waning a little bit. So kind of cannibalizing the other business. But two shows for our time. trio to do eighteen months every Friday night for for eighteen months is a, it's a miracle in this that's, market. That's amazing. You know. And out of that, I think it's a good time in the interview. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your background, but the stuff that's happening right now, I, I got a copy. I listened to your record, um, Just Friends, the uh, trio, the Jim Barnett trio. With Daryl Voss, James Gallardo, recorded at Painted Sky Studios. We want to give them a shout out. The quality, just the recording quality of the tracks is absolutely excellent. Um, I heard it on a small iPhone speaker. Then I heard it on my headphones. And then I went out to the garage and heard it on the big towers. It, there's uh, a difference, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And of course, I grew up with live music. And so you can't substitute that. But no, that is, um, gosh, Jim, um, how, how did that come about to do that record what's the story behind that and when did that how long were you guys playing together as a trio before you went into the studio well about that six month period when they were turning people away and uh it was james idea to uh let's we should we should record you know so we went up to painted sky at daryl and and and, and uh we recorded it actually a year and a half ago in june of 2020 really and, and 20 yeah june of 20, 2021 yeah. excuse me the last year yeah. And uh, so we, we, we recorded 17 tracks, and then we decided on, on 10 of them that were suitable for a CD. And then uh, James kind of quarterbacked the whole process of, of that. Uh, it was slow. Plus, James, frankly, uh, the middle of that year, James left. He got a great gig with uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines. Wow. And, you know, at the age of 31 and you're single, I said, go for it. You know, yeah. I, I know yeah. what it's like to live on a cruise ship. So yeah. I said, you really need to do this. Yeah. And uh, nice. uh, at first, I kind of discouraged them because at the time that they weren't letting the crew members off uh, shore leave because of, of COVID. It was so tight. But eventually they were restricted it, it's open ports. now. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so he's yeah. he's on a cruise ship. He, he I don't know how he did it. He's got his own cabin, and he's part of a show on, a, on one incredible. of the Norwegian cruise line ships. And he's ships. been on less than a year in his first year able to do that. Yeah, yeah. But he, so he, he organized the rest of this, mm-hmm. you know, from the ship mm-hmm. on his on his laptop, uh, emails and all that, to uh, finally get it on Spotify and Apple Music and uh, YouTube, which is where it is now. So I, I have to show for our guest, I want to get this on camera, Mr. Griffin, right here. Uh, <laughs> I printed out today because I don't have a hard copy. When I get one, I'm going to get you to autograph it for uh, me, Sure. But I just want to show this on camera right here. Can we see that pretty good, Griffin? This is the album cover, and I understand James reached out to the same graphic artist that did the Trippin and G cover. Oh. Uh, and did this one. This is excellent work, man. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Just yeah. Friends, the Jim Barnett Trio, available Spotify, Apple, and, uh, and Amazon Music, Google Play, everywhere you get your CDs, Well, it's, right? on, it's on YouTube, uh, Spotify, and, and Apple Music. I don't know about the other two. Nice. Yeah, nice. that's I what think, James said anyway. I think it's there anyway. Yeah. So, folks, um, speaking of your record, uh, I want our listeners to be able to get a feel for that album. And I believe we have the ability to cue up one of the cuts from that record right now, Griffin. Which one do we have right here? 
let's see here. Which track are we looking at right now? Um, how about um, how about Meet the Flintstones, number seven? Can we do that? That's kind of fun. Yeah, it was. Everybody knows that music, right? Yeah. How did you guys ever decide to do this for a jazz record, man? How did that come about? We have songs we call burners. And I turned to Daryl and say, okay, we'll play it as fast as you want. And he just took off and we played it. In the studio? Yeah. And this is pretty much... This is our token fast tune. That's cool. That's cool. So if folks come to see the trio live in the future, this is one of the tunes that you'll throw in just to kind of jolt the show a bit or kind of kick it up a notch? We've been ending our sets with what we call burners. We've got the Flintstones. We've got a fast version of After You've Gone. Uh, wow. What else are we doing? There's a couple more. I can't think of them right now. That's fun. Gosh, this is pretty tight now. How many times did you record this one, Jim, to get it just right? Just two or three. Two or three takes. Can't do that very much. <laughs> and of course, this record was recorded at Painted Sky Studios. What a excellent place. Did can you enjoy they, that Can experience? they hear the bass on what they're, over they're, they, they're listening to? They absolutely oh, okay. can. Yeah. That's his solo, James. Yeah, his fingers were burning. <laughs> so, um, did you record these songs in the order of the sequence or just a totally different order? How did that go, the process of going to the studio? Did you start off with the title track first or how did that come together, Jim? I honestly don't remember. We just recorded a whole bunch of songs, and yeah, and I don't know what order we did them in. Uh, we mainly I selected the order of of the album, yeah, and because uh, I did it, I kind of programmed it a little bit, you know. Uh, we I think the first cut is all the things you are, yeah, yeah, and uh, the last one is just friends. That's the way it turned out. It's kind of a happy song. Now, just friends. Tell me a little bit about that song. Did you have you played that one previously before recording? Was that part of your set? Oh yeah, all of these we done okay. live. All right, fair enough. Yeah, we had done all these things live. Yeah, so you're really comfortable with the song. Oh yeah, yeah. So we just went in and did it. Yeah, and then just friends. How did you arrive at that being the track? Was that a statement about you guys, just friends? It was that kind of a vibe? Or? Uh, I just came up with it one day. You know, what are you going to call it? Oh, it's called Just Friends because that's one of our songs, you know. Nice. Yeah. Nice. It seemed to fit. The Flintstones was already taken for an album title. Well, well yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Jim, going way back, uh, we were talking before we started streaming today. You grew up in Fresno, California. And um, was the first interest in music the trombone or piano? Oh, piano, definitely. Okay. And I, grew how, up a, I grew up in a musical family. Ah, okay. So that was just part of how you cut your teeth, so to speak. Well, Dad was a piano tuner. Okay. Mom played the piano. Dad played the piano. He played uh, piano by, by ear mainly. Uh, Mom was more classically trained. My older sister played the piano. Then I started lessons when I was eight. My younger brother, he played the piano too. And so... Did you guys have to fight over time on the piano? No, not really. <laughs> uh -uh. Actually, we yeah. had two pianos in the living room. And my sister and wow. I used to do stuff written for two pianos. Oh, so you actually grew up with that kind of uh, experience. Yeah, and Dad played saxophone and clarinet uh, on weekends. So he was a jazz musician himself. And uh, that's how I learned all the standards. So I, you know, he would come into the living room, open his sax case, and say, come on, let's play some stuff, he'd say. Yeah, yeah. And it would be Blue Moon or After You've Gone or all this stuff from the 30s and 40s. I learned all the, all the standards from him. It's interesting. When Ken Davis, my son, got involved in swing jazz with the Red Skunk Gypsy Swing Band, for some reason, I knew a lot of those songs, the Fat Swaller and different things. And I realized my dad had a player piano in San Francisco with about 60 rolls. Oh, geez. And I cut my teeth on those rolls. I think I learned how to put them on there. At least I, I think I <laughs> learned how to put them on there. But those songs were embedded in my spirit. You grew up with those. And then in your family, are you the only one that pursued an active career in music? Or did... Uh, some of your siblings also... Uh... No, I was the only one that became a professional musician and actually made a living at it. Hmm. Uh, well, I, I take that back. 
my brother and I, we kind of parted company in junior high, musically speaking. Yeah. I went jazz classical. He went country rock, which, okay, fine. So he went down to L.A., and, and along with uh, uh, the brother of a friend of mine, they had a little rock band down there in L.A., yeah. and then uh, he turned out to be a very fine steel guitar player. You know, the... Oh, the, oh the love murder. steel guitar. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and country fiddle player. Yeah. He has, he has the violin that uh, belonged to my dad's uncle. Oh. In Temecula, California. Wow. And so he lives up in Santa Rosa now. He's retired, and but but he uh, is a fine musician in his own right. That's so cool. That's so cool. So you went, did you leave Fresno to go to Northridge? Was that the first uh, jump that you took as far as your career, or were there detours prior to that? My career, well, I'm a retired musical director. As a musical director, that started in uh, 50 years ago, 1972. Wow. Um through a friend of mine uh, from Fresno, Jim Gandulia, a drummer, mm-hmm. uh, he was uh, drumming with uh, John Davidson, who was being managed by Bob Banner Associates in Beverly Hills. Well, mm-hmm. so what? Well, in 1968, Peggy Fleming won the gold medal, and uh, for ice skating, and I remember that Bob Banner Associates signed her to a five-year contract to do five TV specials in five years. So uh, after the after the fourth one in 1972, they said, you know what? This is too good to not put out on the road. So they got some engineers and carpenters, and everything. they put together. I'm not making this up. They put together a portable ice floor. I uh, they gave me a, an 18-piece orchestra. We had 10 skaters and a bunch of skating and non-skating acts. We called it Peggy Fleming's A Concert on Ice. Wow! And we did a three-month tour in the summer of '72, uh, summer stock theaters on the East Coast. Wow! Did that '72 and '73. So you got your share of just traveling all up and down the East Coast. What, how was those times? How was that for you? It was hot and humid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I got off the plane in Buffalo, New York in July of 72. I thought I was going to die when that humid air hit my lungs. Because I grew up in Fresno. Oh, yeah. Desert rat. Right, right. Yeah. right. It's not like, <laughs> not like Wichita Falls, Texas, where no, I was at no, the Air no, Force. No. no, Big difference between the dry valley heat and the heat back east. Yeah. yeah. But to answer your first question, when did we move? Yeah. Uh, through the same contact, my friend Jim, he also uh, went from Davidson. He was playing drums for Johnny Mathis. And uh, I had an opportunity in 72 and 73 when I wasn't with Peggy Fleming to fill in uh, for Mathis's piano player a couple of times. Wow. So I got to know the folks, kept in touch. You know, anything happened, let me know. Yeah. Sure enough, uh, his conductor, piano player, quit. At the end of '73, and they said, uh, "Would you, you know you still inter- reached out to you? Still you inter- first, I said, yeah, first right of refusal. Yeah, yeah. So February '74 is is when I joined Mathis, and April of that year we moved from Fresno to Northridge. Was that a pinch me what happened moment in your life? Because that's a big step. I mean, Johnny Mathis is. There's so many generations that that love Johnny Mathis. I grew up in San Francisco. I remember my mother introduced me to him. The records, TV shows, and he still plays. He was just at Chumash Casino, I believe, the other night, right? Yeah, I was down there. Yeah. He's yeah. 87, going strong. I saw your post. You said the boss still has it. <laughs> he does. 87 is still going strong. I want to be 87 and still going strong. <laughs> Me too. All right. <laughs> What's his secret? What is his secret to still do what he does with the charm and the... What, what do you think? Because you spent... What? How many years with with Johnny? Is Four and it? a half. Okay. Yeah. Till till okay. August of seventy eight. Okay. Um, well, I think he loves what he does. If if it were up to him, uh, at least back in those days, he would record, play golf, and he's a gourmet cook. He loves to cook in his kitchen. Really. And uh, he 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 never really felt comfortable performing because he was kind of shy, and he couldn't understand why all these people came to his. Came, came to his concert. I said, well, <laughs> you evidently don't know who you are. Because <laughs> 70 albums later, you know. That's incredible. He was a high jumper also in San Francisco? Uh, San Francisco State. Yeah. He, he was there with, uh, ironically, Bill Russell. Wow. And um, he he huh. held the record for the high jump uh, for years. In 1956, uh, he had a, uh, a choice to go into the Olympics or music. He was singing at the Black Hawk in San Francisco, mm. which you well know. Mm. And Charles Avedon, talent scout from Columbia Records, was out from New York, heard him sing. He sent a very famous now telegram 
saying, uh, send contracts. This kid could go all the way. Has all the bells and whistles could go all the way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And wow. so uh, timing, timing and fate right there. So they invited him back to New York. He thought he was going for a weekend that he ended up staying for three years. That's amazing. And, and that was the very start of his career yeah. right there. Yeah. Misty, wow. chances are not for me to say 12th and never, you know, and incidentally, uh, 10 years later, Johnny's Greatest Hits, that album was on Billboard's Top 100 for 480 weeks. That is a crazy. I thought Pink Floyd held that. I mean, that's just crazy. I know. That's amazing. The Beatles might have beat it, but and in the same time, he was the only one to have four albums, not singles, four albums on Billboard's Top 100 at the same, same time. time. It just shows his longevity, the genres that he crossed, and how widespread the response was for Johnny Mathis. He's still doing it. But a Christmas show, is that a kind of Johnny's Hallmark, Christmas music? and Well, his Christmas album was, yeah, was a, a big seller, and he's really known for his Christmas stuff, but he's known for everything else. Yeah. But I, I've, you know, I've done the show a bunch of times, and this was the most Christmassy show I've ever seen him do. It was, almost, it was like 80% Christmas music, and, of course, he tossed in, uh, you know, uh, Misty, and chances are, not for me to say, they loved that, but... Because uh, he had to do that. You can't do it. He can't do a show and not do those no, hits. No, be like the Rolling Stones, yeah. not doing Satisfaction <laughs> well, or something. But the uh, yeah, the, the crowd, of course, is my age and older. And and uh, but it was there was it was packed down there at Chumash. Was it pretty much sold out? Yeah, I think so. Tickets were yeah. starting at one sixty each. No, 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 no. Tickets were sixty nine to one oh nine. Oh, really? Yeah. The last time he was here. They were more expensive. I wonder if I went to a site that was mumping the tickets up, because I went to a site right before the show. I thought maybe I can run. Well, maybe down right there. before the show. I they think I up. think tickets were one sixty nine, and they may have well, had a sellout. Yeah, that just shows the demand there. <laughs> wow, it's like the airline. If you wait to the last minute, you pay more than if you booked yeah. a tube once ago. Yeah. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. <laughs> Gosh. Um, so already, I mean, your career is already taken on this this pace. How? There's a lot we can talk about with Johnny Mathis. I want to show a video clip right now. Um, this is actually Church on the Way, Van Nuys, California. Pastor Jack Hayford, a uh, really good friend of ours before Jack passed, wrote his autobiography, David Moore. Uh, met Jack, I think, through Life Bible College or something. Very fascinating. Did you Did you get to know Jack during that period of time? Was he the chief pastor at that time, Jack Hayford? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I started attending the church on the way at the end of 1974. Wow. And I became the, the music uh, director there in 85. Wow. And that's when we did our first, not first, but we my first musical Christmas production with a 135-voice choir and a 45-piece orchestra. 135-voice yeah. choir. And the, the orchestra was all L.A. musicians, many, many of whom went to our church. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, we've got a, a clip, uh, a video clip, Jim Barnett, and this is Jim Barnett, uh, a piano solo. I think it's about a five-minute clip during that performance, and this is from The Music of Christmas, The Church on the Way, and uh, can we uh, can we stream that right now, Griffith, for our viewers? Thanks so much. I was 36. Right <laughs> <laughs> has, lot, I was a lot younger then. Has it gone by fast, <laughs> Jim Barnett? Uh, yes and no.
And that was Jim Barnett, and that was part of the uh, Music of Christmas, Church on the Way. You said that was 1978? 1985. 19, we don't want to go back that far. 1985. Jim, that was amazing. The, the orchestra, the sound, the mm-hmm. equipment. And then you mentioned during that, when that was playing, that you came up with that ending piece right there on the spot, man. Uh, well, yeah. well, the jazz section and the cadenza, yeah. 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 That's cool. Well, that's what jazz is. But you, <laughs> <laughs> but you were playing, you listed some of the names of the people that were part of that orchestra oh, that was showing Oh, yeah. Up. Some of them went to our church, Alex Acuna, Chester Thompson, Bill Maxwell, uh, the percussion section. I mean, what a perc- percussion oh. section. Oh. And I mentioned Pete Condoli, who was the lead trumpet player of Tonight Show Band. He was lead trumpet player in our show. Well, he also went to our church along with other people like Pat wow. Boone and and uh, he had a built-in Delight. orchestra of yeah. deluxe. That's incredible. And Dean Jones. We had some uh, some celebrities went to the church because the congregation was really it was really cool. Nobody bothered them. Nobody said, "Gee, can I have your autograph?" Yeah, I mean, come on. It wasn't that. Type no, of no. It was, they they were just part of we were just part of the family. You yeah, know? yeah. It was yeah. very cool. That's so cool. I've got um, one of the cuts that I listened to, Jim, in preparing for our stream today. Uh, and we talked a little bit about it on the phone earlier today. Pieces of Dreams, uh, one of my rare on-camera performances. Later, Johnny Carson talked about, I guess, when he did his retirement show. Can you talk a little bit about that, then we'll stream this? Yeah, during those four and a half years with Mathis, I did about 10 Tonight Shows. And so I got to know Doc Severson, which was, <laughs> talk about a thrill. I was 25 years old, for crying out loud. Anyway, you know, I, I go to Tonight Show Plan, it's like, you know, I felt like I felt like I was a little kid. Can we play my charts, please? Yeah. I didn't do that. I, yeah. you know, I was acting cool, but uh, sure. but the arrangements that I wrote, uh, they played them and they were happy to do it. So a lot of the stuff that's on those uh, Tonight Show cuts were my arrangements. This is not. This was composed and arranged by Michel Legrand, mm-hmm. who. Uh, French, just French genius. Uh, Windmills of Your Mind, mm. uh, uh, Summer of 42, uh, mm. Brian's theme. I mean, uh, all these great melodies yep. he wrote. And he wrote this song, kind of obscure ballad, Pieces of Dreams. And uh, it's true. At the end of, of Carson's 30 years of doing The Tonight Show in 92, wow. he looked back and he said, that was the most memorable moment of the 30 years I've wow. been doing this. Wow. Did they show a clip? on that night of this of this particular piece did they show that on his retirement night he referred to it and they showed it i don't know that he referred to okay. it on his retirement night i know that he referred to it to somebody a reporter or ah, somebody gotcha. i don't know gotcha okay yeah how that got expressed but uh yeah and when the orchestra kicks in yeah i'm i'm on camera at the piano well let's, let's directing the orchestra let's stream uh, jim barnett just a little bit younger <laughs> <laughs> This is a song that was written by a friend of mine that I think is really one of the finest composers for motion pictures. His name is Michel Legrand. This is one of his lesser known compositions, but it's formidable music by a great composer. It's called Pieces of Dreams. Little boy lost in search of little boy found. You go wandering, wandering, stumbling, tumbling round. of your mind and why are you blind to all you ever were never were really are nearly are little boy falls in search of little boy true Will you be ever done traveling always unraveling you in strings 
is the sense of it. is the sense of it little boy blue don't let your little sheep roam it's time come blow your heart meet them all back in the and studio back. with Jim Barnett and <laughs> that was uh, that was amazing nothing less than amazing and uh, of course that was the tonight show pieces of dreams and uh, the crescendo on that music is just absolutely incredible and that last note is 32 seconds long wow wow that is absolutely incredible that's the uh, that's the beauty of YouTube we're able to bring back these memories and show them to our streaming audience here yeah. today and uh, how does it feel to look back on, on these uh, clips and these special moments, Jim? I'm thankful. Really yeah. appreciate that I was I'll, allowed the privilege to do stuff like that. You yeah. Know? And and probably still could, but I'm retired. <laughs> yeah. We've got um, I one of the other clips that I came across that I absolutely love. I love the song, The Way We Were. And um, oh. we've got, uh, we'd like to show that right now. And maybe you can Is open. Is that from the Canada I, yeah, it is. It absolutely is. It's from uh, 1975, the Edmund Alberta Symphony Orchestra. What? What? How did that happen? What's well, that? Yeah, uh, uh, Jack Solbel from New York he paid for the whole thing, a couple million dollars. Anyway, he wanted to do a, a 90 minute, uh, well, a 60 minute TV special, but it was a 90 minute uh, concert. Yeah. With the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. Well, that being said, the strings. It was a 65-piece orchestra, which was incredible. But that was like the highlight, I think, of my four and a half years because I had my arrangements were being played by a 65-piece orchestra, and I'm like 26 years old conducting this whole thing. I'm wow. going, geez, pinch me now. Yeah. But <laughs> the strings were from the symphony. The the horn players, the trumpets, trombones, and saxes, uh, they were from uh, – Tommy Banks was the Canadian uh, equivalent of Doc Severinsen. Gotcha. He – CBC – they had their own like quote tonight show kind of thing in yeah, Canada. Yeah. Well, th these were that was the band that wow. came wow. and joined those strings, you know. And we did a rehearsal that afternoon and and just did it. But uh, the way we were, I I used uh, 
uh, I it was my arrangement, and I, I I wrote it as an alto sax solo, uh, weaving in and out because Dad played alto sax. Oh, okay. And, so you uh, can kind of hear. Even that. though he was very much alive then, he did die in '89, and mm. so it's very uh, nostalgic for me to see that clip. So this is actually going to be a tribute to your dad. In, in, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, in a That's way. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. Memories light the corners of my mind. Misty watercolor memories of the way we were. Scattered pictures of the smiles we left behind, smiles we gave to one another for the way. Can it be that it was all so simple then? Or has time rewritten every line? And if we had the chance to do it all again, tell me, would we? Could we? And that's a tribute to uh, to your dad. What was your dad's name, Jim? Uh, Chet. 
Chet, Chet, Chet Barnett. Barnett. Yeah, he was a piano tuner and a, a musician. He played saxophone and clarinet. All right. Another multi-instrumentalist like Jim <laughs> Barnett. And uh, for our uh, listeners that are just tuning in, our viewers, we're uh, in the studio, Slow Talk Live, with Jim Barnett. Jim, this is a, uh, is a crazy fun afternoon for me. I love music. I grew up with a transistor radio on my pillow. And um, piano, my wife plays piano, and piano just seems to be this magic in every different uh, decade, every different style of music. Piano, Elton John, look at what he did. It's the craziest thing. Um, piano is your main instrument. Do you still play a little trombone? Or no. Little, nothing? I don't even have a trombone. Don't even have a trombone. That's <laughs> way, way back there. Long time ago. What kind of piano do you have at home, uh, Jim? Well, it's very special. It's a 1957 Baldwin Baby Grand. It's the piano I grew up with. Wow. My dad bought it in 59 when I was 10. Uh, and uh, he brought it home, and my sister and I practiced on that for years. And then... Uh, Mom died eight years ago at the age of 93 mm. in Fresno. So I had my friend Louie, Louie's piano moving down there in, yeah. in Santa Maria. Yes. To plug Louie. Anyway. I, I know Louie. He <laughs> yeah. moved a jukebox for well, me. There you go. <laughs> I said, can you go over and get my, my mother's piano because I'm on a cruise ship. Would you just store it for me? So yeah. he stored it for me. And then when I quit doing the ships, yeah. he brought it over to over Royal Grandy and I have it in my living room. And there it sits. Yep. That's so cool. Yeah. What a blessing. Every time you play it, it must bring back rich memories. It's of mom it. and dad. It has a real library keyboard. You know, it's ebony. Oh, and, wow. Uh, wow. I try to keep it in tune. <laughs> <laughs> the, roofer's, the roofer's roof. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the shoe, shoemaker's shoes, yeah. We've got, um, gosh, we're going to be streaming here for a little bit more, and we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Of course, I want to remind our viewers that Castillo Carpet Cleaning, our sponsor, and Slow Talk Podcasting Studio. Check us out at slowtalk.com. In the studio with Jim Barnett, we're going to, um, before we get back to your most recent, or to your record, uh, Just Friends, which I love, and I want to play a few more songs and talk about that, I, I want to play the Christmas song, Jim Barnett, and that was um, on The Tonight Show, and uh, Johnny Mathis decided to do the Christmas song with just you and him on piano. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was not normal, right? Well, no, usually we had arrangements for the for the, the band, and yeah. so... Uh, he wanted to do it with just me. And I thought, gosh, we got the whole band sitting here, John. We really want to do that? Yeah, yeah. okay, fine. So uh, the procedure was, to, rehearsal was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We'd go to NBC at 3 o'clock. we run through a couple of tunes. We're done by 3.15. Well, they taped the show from, at back, back in those days, it was a 90-minute show. So let's say they, they taped it from 5.30 to 7.00. And then they did whatever they had to do editing-wise so NBC could play it at 8.30 for the East Coast. Because uh, tonight's show, 11.30. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. so usually um, John and the guys and whoever wanted to, we, it was in Burbank, and we'd go across the street and have Mexican food <laughs> in between. Yeah. Well, I stayed behind, and, and uh, Doc was walking around stage with his trumpet, and I got to talking to him, and he kind of chided me uh, about, the, about the Christmas song. He said, I said, hey, I'm sorry to, you know, I didn't bring a chart for you. He said, well, if you had any class kit, you'd write something. I said, okay. You took so, that challenge. So yeah. I took, I got a hold of uh, Shelly Cohen, who is the assistant music director, the librarian. Yeah. I said, Shelly, give me some score paper. So I wrote out the last 16 bars after the key change, and we didn't rehearse it. We just did it. And I, <laughs> I just had it, had him handed it out to the guys, and they came in at the end. <laughs> and they they yeah. were across the street having Mexican food. No, no they weren't. Were. We were. I don't know what oh. the, what they do. I don't okay. know if they go to the commissary or whatever. But but yeah. we, that's what we were doing anyway. Yeah. So yeah, so I sat down and I wrote I wrote the last sixteen bars for the band and they played it and it, f fortunately for me it worked. <laughs> it, it sounds like you know just in what you're saying the tone that your uh, ability to serve and to be the musical director it grew there was a trust there and a good fit for those years. Oh yeah, absolutely. Neat. Yeah, that's yeah. So well, I would, because usually when we'd go to a place, well, back in those days, the market would would support being at a place for a whole week. Yeah, you know, we'd go to Mill Run Theater in Chicago or or McCormick Place or whatever. Wow. Uh, Westbury, you no, know, Long Island, anywhere, and it would, for a week, we'd do a three hour rehearsal the day of. Yeah, and he didn't come to rehearsal till the last ten minutes just to do a sound check. So Is he, that right? He trust me. I know you know what I want. I said, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. we'll do it. Yeah. He, he expected, and of course you would deliver. I knew what he wanted, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and how he wanted it. Yeah. yeah. Well, But we also had, 
We had an office in Hollywood, the, uh, the 17th floor of the Sunset Vine Towers back in those days. Yeah. Henry Mancini was on the 10th floor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had a music room with a Steinway in it, and that's where he and I would work out the arrangements. Mm -hmm. He would oftentimes say, okay, this is, I want to do this song, but I want this special thing right here. I'm going to sing just, I'm going to sing these notes. And he would sing me what he wanted. Yeah. Go, fine, write it down. Uh, Made sure you did it that way. And he did what he wanted. Was he always like that, knew exactly what he wanted? Was he just a very focused individual? Is that? Uh... He usually knew what he wanted, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Interesting. And that's longevity to be a music director for four years. I mean, you know, some folks don't last more than a year. <laughs> I want to, um, I want to, um, let's see, uh, let's, let's go ahead and stream that right now. Let's, let's do that for our viewers. Thanks yeah, for that, that introduction. That's the Christmas song story. All right. Let's, <laughs> let's do the Christmas song right now. <laughs> Chestnuts roasting on an open fire Jack Frost nipping at your nose Yuletide carols being sung by a choir And folks dressed up like Eskimos Everybody knows a turkey and some mistletoe help to make the season bright. Tiny tots with their eyes all aglow will find it hard to sleep tonight. They know that sand on his way He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh And every mother's child is gonna spy To see if reindeer really know how to fly And so I the simple phrase to kids from one to ninety two although it's been said many times many ways Merry Christmas to you they know that Santa He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh And every mother's child is gonna spy To see if reindeer really know From one to ninety-two Although it's been said Many times, many ways Merry Christmas To And that, that, of course, is uh, Jim Burnett on piano on The Tonight Show. And that's a Christmas song by the one and only Johnny Mathis. The one and only. Amazing. Jim, uh, there's a lot of magic in your life. And um, before we uh, finish our stream this afternoon, uh, my gosh, your, latest, your record, 
uh, Just Friends. I, I want folks to hear a few more cuts of that. Um, it is available on Apple Music. It's available on Amazon, Spotify. But it's the uh, the Jim Barnett Trio, Just Friends. Uh, also, James Gallardo on bass and Daryl Voss on drums. A lot of these songs we were talking about earlier. Uh, did we show the clip at Allegretto yet? I mean, at Libretto. All right, that would be totally you fitting. Video of that we absolutely do. <laughs> we're, it may not. No, it's not of his record. You're not prepared to show it. We don't have enough time. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna show that on the next stream uh, for their viewers to come back in. We'll show that, or we'll put that up on YouTube. But we actually have a one minute twenty five second clip that I shot up at uh, Libretto. Oh, which, really? Which oh, it's fun. I'll send you a copy. Too. I didn't even know that. Yeah, that's the <laughs> clip that I had emailed over. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, we can uh, cue up a song. We played the Flintstone song. We played the uh, the samba, and uh, I want to play another cut here from the record. Maybe the title cut. Would you like to like to introduce the title cut, Jim, and how, how you came about on that one? Well, yeah, just friends. Yeah, yeah it, it's a fun tune, uh, and it's been around for a long time. And in fact, the first time I heard it was uh, the Singers Unlimited. Uh, did it back in the 70s, mm. and uh, we did a TV show in Germany in 1976, West Germany then. The Singers Unlimited, not the Love Unlimited Orchestra. No, 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 no. Okay. The Singers Unlimited was uh, it was like the Hilos plus Bonnie Herman, kind okay. of, you know, and okay. she was incredible. But anyway, they did uh, they did Just Friends on our show, and I got, well, that's a great tune, you know, I've always been a great tune. Yeah. It was, I put it on in our sets at Libretto and stuff, and so that... Uh, we decided to re record that, and, and I thought it was good enough to put on the on the album, and also to title the record, the uh, title yeah. cut, just yeah. once. All right, let's. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and play that right now for our listening and viewing audience. Can they hear us talking?
And that is the title cut from the Jim Barnett Trio. And that is Just Friends. And uh, Just Friends, we're almost out of time here. Yeah. Uh, in closing <laughs> with Jim Barnett this afternoon. Jim, this has been a lot of fun, man. Yeah, fun for me, too. I'd love James. to bring you back. There's always a next time, right? Okay. I'd really love to bring you back. And I'd love just to just to get an understanding of, of the cruise industry, what that was like. And towards the end, you went on multiple ships. And I think that'd be really fun uh, for folks to reminisce about a cruise they were on or for some of our audience that have never been on a cruise, man. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Would you come back and do that with oh, us? Oh, absolutely. Talk about whatever you want. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> Folks, um, this is um, Slow Talk Live, and we've been talking here with Jim Barnett. And um, if you want to get his record, check it out. Also, what's the website, Jim, for your piano tuning? Oh, well, it's basically uh, uh, Jim Barnett Music Services dot com. Jim Barnett Music Services. Now, they can get piano tuning, but if they own a restaurant or some venue, a winery, and they're happen to watch in this and going, I've got to get Jim Barnett or Jim and uh, Daryl or Jim Daryl and James. Yeah, they can can they do that right yeah. through the website? Sure, absolutely. There my we my go. phone number is there, my email address, everything. Excellent. Yeah. We also want to thank Castile Carpet Cleaning, located right here in San Luis Obispo. Check them out. Their uh, web address is castilloscarpetcleaning.com. I can recommend and appreciate what they do. They've done our studio. They've done our home. And we so much appreciate them. And then we want to offer Slow Talk Podcasting Studio. We're a turnkey podcasting studio located right in San Luis Obispo. We produce, develop, record, distribute, and market your podcast series. Call us up at 805-234-5056. I would be remiss today if I did not thank... Uh, Griffin Brashear is our streaming engineer. So much appreciate Griffin. We're going to post some pictures we took in the studio today. And I tell him he brings the magic every time. And, you know, he tries to downplay. But the guy is so talented. And um, so much appreciate him making it happen. Uh, appreciate all the people that got Slow Talk Studio into our fifth year right now. We've already celebrated our fifth year. And we're looking forward to the future. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to come up with some surprises and some really great interviews coming up in January. And uh, got a very special surprise we're going to announce real soon. For Wednesday, January 4th, we'll be back on Slow Talk Live. I'm going to sign off right here. James Davis signing out. I think next time we'll have, uh, we'll have some fun. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Have a great, have a great day. Thanks, James. Yeah, thanks, Jim. <laughs>